Well, good afternoon. I'm Rick Edelman. Thanks so much for joining me on this webinar today. I'm very excited about it. I'm a little bit uh, nervous too, as I present to you why Bitcoin's price will reach $420,000. If you've been following me for any length of time, you know that I really never make predictions and I will kind of argue that I'm not making one today. Although I suspect some folks may disagree with me on that. Uh, and it's going to be a very interesting conversation, a very thought-provoking thought conversation. And I really want to say thank you to Franklin Templeton Digital Assets and to Bitwise Asset Management for sponsoring this event and making it available for me to bring to you. Unlike most of our webinars where I'm interviewing experts in the field, it's just me that you're stuck with today. Uh, so all the content you're about to see is coming exclusively from me. And I, due to the nature of this uh, topic, I wanna emphasize that this is not advice, this is not a recommendation, that this is education only. You are strongly encouraged to do your own research. If you're not a financial advisor, get one and rely on your financial advisor's recommendations before you make any investment decision based on any of the content you hear in this program. And if I can think of any more disclaimers, I'll let you know. We're going to have plenty of opportunity, I'm hoping, for Q&A toward the end. So uh, as you hear me say whatever it is I'm saying, go into the Q&A box here on Zoom and type in your question. Later on in the program, when I'm done blowing through my slides here for you, Don Friedman, the president of DACFP, will uh, curate your questions and present them to me on your behalf and we'll engage in as best a dialogue as we can. And hopefully I'll cover just as many of those questions as possible. Uh, so uh, without any further ado, let's begin the conversation as to why Bitcoin's price is going to reach $420,000. Uh, this conversation really begins uh, based on uh, a, a conversation that I had on CNBC about, I guess, two months ago now. Uh, Matt, Matt Hogan, the chief investment officer of Bitwise, and I were being interviewed on CNBC by Bob Pisani, good friend of ours. Uh, and um, Bob had asked, you know, at this point, the the big uh, the the Bitcoin spot ETFs were really, really rather new. They were less than a, a month old. They were only a few weeks old at the time. And Bob asked what uh, we thought was going to be the impact of these ETFs in the marketplace. My response, which you may have seen because this video clip from Bob's interview has pretty much gone viral on LinkedIn and, and X and, uh, and other social media sites. I made the comment that I believed that we were going to see $150 billion flow into these ETFs over the next two years from independent RAAs alone, ignoring the wirehouses, family offices, institutional investors, retail investors, just the, the independent RAA channel by itself was gonna generate $150 billion in flows. Uh, and, uh, and let me just show you uh, how I arrived at that set of math, uh, because it's really pretty clear there are 300,000 financial advisors working with independent REA firms uh, across the country. And collectively, the REA channel manages $8 trillion in assets. According to our research uh, that we have done here at DACFP uh, in surveys we've done with Franklin Templeton, along with other survey research we've seen from other organizations, all the numbers say the same thing. Between 75 and 80% of financial advisors have been saying for the past two years that their intent was to use the spot Bitcoin ETFs when they became available, and that on average, they were going to place two to 3% of assets into those ETFs when they became available. Well, just do the math. Uh, 300,000 advisors, 8 trillion in assets, 77% of that 8 trillion with a 2% allocation, that translates to $150 billion into Bitcoin. So that's where I came up with the number that I shared with Bob Bassani on CNBC. Bob then asked another question. What did I believe was going to be the future price of Bitcoin as a result of these inflows? And I said that I believed Bitcoin would hit $150,000. Uh, Matt didn't uh, disagree with me. Uh, the question is, how soon might that occur? I think that's the biggest question people had. But after that segment was over, 
I got to thinking, where did I come up with $150 billion uh, or rather the $150,000 that Bitcoin's future price would be based on these flows. I, for me, it was rather anecdotal. I was just basically figuring that with $150 billion flowing into Bitcoin, with an asset that at that time had about a $600 million market cap, that uh, this kind of an is asset flow would have a big impact on the demand of Bitcoin and where there's a fixed supply, as we all know, 19 million coins roughly uh, available right now, that it would translate in Bitcoin's price rising from at the time around $50,000 to uh, $150,000. But it occurred to me that that really wasn't a terribly specific mathematical calculation. And so um, it, it spurred me to do a little bit of work and think about quantifying more precisely uh, how we might determine what the future price of Bitcoin might be. And, and this whole conversation really emanates because of what's been going on in the crypto space. Uh, the Bank of England says that blockchain technology could transform the entire uh, global financial system. The technology is projected to grow 10x just over the next four years alone. Already, we have tokenized a billion dollars in treasury notes on public blockchains. And it's now expected to have a 10x increase on the number, uh, the dollar value of treasuries on those blockchains. In fact, we already have two very important funds that have been uh, available. Franklin Templeton was the first to launch Benji. Uh, this is a digital token called Benji. You actually download an app uh, off of your uh, smartphone and you can invest in the industry's first blockchain-based money market fund. This is rather astonishing. Franklin Templeton was the first to do this. And just a couple of months ago, you recall BlackRock announcing the creation of Biddle, uh, which is another on-chain tokenized treasury fund. Between these two funds, Franklin Templeton is still the biggest at about $350 million in assets. BlackRock already has a quarter of a million. This is clearly something of tremendous interest to a lot of people. Gartner, in fact, says that right now, the global blockchain market is about $176 billion in size. And by 2030, just you know, five years or so from now, it's going to be $3 trillion. Just to visualize what that really means in terms of growth, can you see the white dot on the left-hand side of your screen? That white dot represents the size of the global blockchain market today. In 2030, that white dot will become this. That's pretty substantial growth in just five years or so. This is why PwC says that uh, we're going to be adding nearly $2 trillion to global GDP by the end of the decade, thanks to the growth and development of crypto, blockchain, uh, and digital assets. 90% of the world's banks are developing the technology. JP Morgan Chase says it's going to save banks $120 billion a year. And this is why hundreds of millions of people all around the world already own Bitcoin and why we are so widely expecting that this is going to be uh, growing at a rather significant pace uh, over the next uh, several years. So uh, it's not just that. Already here in the United States, 22% of U.S. adults own Bitcoin. And in fact, 83% of millennial millionaires own crypto. And teenagers? What are they thinking about it? Well, T.R. Price does a really fascinating survey. Uh, of teenagers and, and their parents on an annual basis. And in the most recent survey, they asked teenagers, if we gave you $100 to invest, what would you buy? 57% said that they would buy crypto. Only 38% said that they would buy stocks. I'm not sure that these kids are going to change their minds as they get older. And 51% of teens say that crypto is the future of investing. We've got billionaires buying Bitcoin today, major corporations, endowment funds, pension funds ranging from South Korea to Fairfax County, Virginia, and the 
Houston Firefighters Fund. We have, as a result of all this, seen an awful lot of Bitcoin predictions and projections. Uh, in 2024, Standard Chartered, one of the biggest banks in England, says that Bitcoin is going to reach $100,000. Metricsport says it's going to reach $150,000 by the end of this year. And Tim Draper says it's going to hit $250,000. By next year, Alliance Bernstein says Bitcoin will reach $150,000. JP Morgan says it'll do it, but not until 2030. Coinpedia says by 2030, it'll be 350,000. And we all know what Kathy Wood and Michael Saylor are saying. Kathy Wood is predicting that Bitcoin will hit $1.5 million. And Michael says 5 million will be the price of Bitcoin. But here's the thing that's been bothering me about all of these predictions, including the one I made on CNBC. Nobody that I have seen has explained in simple, easy math, how they arrived at their predictions. And that is what has gotten me a little bit frustrated. And this is the basis on which I wanted to evaluate exactly, just based on simple arithmetic, what might we expect the future price of Bitcoin to be? So why are we paying attention to this? Well, here's one pretty profound reason. The AGB, the Association of Governing Boards of Universities and Colleges, they wrote that crypto has already produced hundreds of millionaires, a number of billionaires, and may produce the world's first trillionaires within the next decade. Why does the Association of Governing Boards of Universities care about this? Because they love to raise money for their endowments, which they tend to get from their alumni. And if their alumni are buying Bitcoin and their alumni get rich doing so, these folks are going to want their share of donations. So that all brings us to my viewpoint. Bitcoin's price will reach $420,000. And I want to share with you right now how I arrived at that number. It's really simple arithmetic. The data I'm about to share with you is as of 1231. That's the most recent data I was able to get. The global equity market is $123 trillion. The value of all the stocks all over the world, $123 trillion. The global debt market is $138 trillion. The global real estate market is $379 trillion. A lot of folks don't realize that real estate is three times bigger than the stock market. Gold is worth $14 trillion in total market cap. There's $53 trillion in cash laying around the world. And within all of this, there's Bitcoin. As of December 31, Bitcoin's market cap was $0.8 trillion. Well, you add it all up and the total market cap, the total wealth in all the world is $708 trillion. Well, take that number and think about this. If just 50% of everybody who owns that asset all over the world, all the stocks and bonds and real estate and gold and cash all around the world, if just 50% of the people who own these assets allocate just 1% of these assets into Bitcoin, the flows into Bitcoin would be $3.5 trillion. Well, 3.5 trillion is an important number because we also know that there's 19,400,000 Bitcoins that have been mined so far. See, the fascinating thing about Bitcoin is that we know exactly how many there, there are, how many that have been mined, and how many there will ultimately be mined. We know because this is hard-coded into the source code that Satoshi wrote when Satoshi invented Bitcoin back in 2009, there will ever only be 21 million Bitcoins ever produced. And so far, we've produced 19.4 million of those Bitcoins. This number is locked. It is fixed. We can't say that about stocks. A given company that issues stock, they might issue more stock later on. They may do a stock split 
they may do a stock buyback. We can't ever really be sure how many shares of a company there may one day be. But we do know it about Bitcoin. And that makes the arithmetic really easy because we know that right now, 19.4 million Bitcoins have been uh, issued so far. And if we are projecting a three and a half trillion dollar flow, well, you simply divide three and a half trillion by 19.4 million. And there you have it, $196,000 per coin. But this is as of now with the flows I'm projecting of three and a half trillion, we have to add the existing value of Bitcoin. And I'm going to use the 1231 value because I'm using the 1231 market caps for stocks, bonds, real estate, gold, and cash. So back on December 31st, Bitcoin's price was 42,000. If we add in the 196,000 from the new flows, assuming that half of everybody puts in 1% of assets, Bitcoin's price would be $238,000. This is, as I said, an assumption that 50% of the world's wealth has an allocation of 1% into Bitcoin. But what happens if everybody allocates 1%? Now, you could argue that's rather pie in the sky, you know, since when does everybody do anything together in sync? But think about it. Everybody who's an investor owns stocks. Everybody who's an investor owns bonds. Everybody who's an investor owns real estate and has cash. So why is it unreasonable to assume that in the future, as Bitcoin becomes more mainstreamed, more established and reasonable as an addition to a diversified portfolio, why is it so unreasonable to assume that everybody, all 100% of investors all over the world would allocate 1% of the portfolio to Bitcoin. If that were to happen, that would be flows of $7 trillion, producing a Bitcoin price of 378,000. You add in the 42,000 as of last December, and there you have it. $420,000 becomes the price of Bitcoin. But you know what? This is assuming a 1% allocation for every portfolio in the world. I think it's quite possible that if in fact Bitcoin does go mainstream to such a degree, an awful lot of investors aren't going to limit themselves to a low 1% of assets. I don't know of any investors who have a low 1% of any asset that they own. If they're gonna bother owning it, they're gonna own more of it than mere 1%. What if these folks around the world agreed that the digital asset category warranted a 5% allocation? That's something we often typically see with gold and precious metals or energy or real estate. What if that were to happen? We'd be talking about $35 trillion of flows into Bitcoin divided by those 19 point uh, 4 million coins, and we'd be looking at a Bitcoin price of nearly $1.9 million. In other words, right now, this is the asset allocation of the world's assets. And the sliver of Bitcoin here is so small at one-tenth of 1%, one you can't even really see it in the pie. It represents Bitcoin's $42,000 price back on 1231. But if the, we suddenly had a world where everybody allocated 1%, we would have Bitcoin at $420,000. And if Bitcoin was at 5%, well, now we would have a $1.9 million asset as part of a globally diversified portfolio. But you know, if we're gonna play this game of conjecture, I think this is actually flawed because I don't think the world is gonna wake up one day next week or next month and suddenly everybody allocating 5% to Bitcoin. That, come on, that, that we can all agree that's not gonna happen. But what might happen is that we'll slowly get there, that we might add 1% of our assets to Bitcoin this year 
And maybe next year we add another percent and another percent. And we add slowly to our crypto allocation until it eventually hits 5% of the portfolio. Well, let's take a look at that assumption. By 2025, we have 1% allocation into Bitcoin. That means the world's total assets of 763 trillion with a 1% allocation to Bitcoin, remember there's 19.4 million coins, that puts Bitcoin's price at nearly $400,000. The following year, we have an additional 1% allocation and then another 1% allocation. Do you notice what's happening? Each year, the global GDP is growing. So while the GDP today is 708,000, by 2025, it's 763. By 2027, it's 889. By the year 2028, global GDP is 958 trillion. By 2029, global GDP, that's not 10. That's a one and the letter O. That's an octillion. Yeah, we are going to grow up in a world where we start talking about octillions. One octillion is a thousand trillion. And we hit that number with global GDP in 2029. I'm assuming here, by the way, an 8% annual return. So not an outrageous uh, assumption. And by 2030, we're at 1.1 octillion in global GDP. And that puts Bitcoin's price at $2.9 million. But here's something else really interesting. I have been using the number 19,400,000. As I've said, this is the number of Bitcoins that have been mined since Bitcoin's inception back in 2009. But everybody in the crypto community acknowledges a whole lot of those coins are gone. They have been lost or destroyed. It's kind of like, you know, we've got a whole bunch of gold at the bottom of the Mediterranean. Spanish galleons, Roman fleets that these ships sank over the eons, sinking with them their holdings of gold and precious metals and other uh, assets that they were delivering from one place to another. Here in the Caribbean, closer to home, we know that they occasionally find shipwrecks of uh, uh, stores of vaults and uh, safes and such that are holding jewels and gems and diamonds from hundreds of years ago. By the similar notion, we've all heard the stories of people who have lost their Bitcoin. There's the guy in England who accidentally threw out his hard drive and he went to the local town and asked the town council for permission to go dig into the uh, landfill. The town council has refused his request. The amount of Bitcoin that are on that hard drive that he accidentally threw away is today worth about a billion dollars? Or how about the guy who went public after he put his Bitcoin on a cold wallet storage device that had a special password encoding system and he forgot his password and he went public because his particular device only gave him 10 tries. And if he failed all 10, the device would be locked forever. He went public after he failed seven times. The last I heard, he had failed two more and I don't know what happened after that. His Bitcoin was worth several hundred million dollars. And then there was the story of the gentleman from the Middle East who uh, died in a uh, boating accident in the Mediterranean, widely regarded as a Bitcoin billionaire. He owned over $2 billion worth of Bitcoin. His family knew all about it. So did his business associates, but nobody knew his private key. And so when he died, his $2 billion of Bitcoin disappeared with him. We've heard all of those stories. And the general attitude is that about $4 million, I'm sorry, strike that, 4 million Bitcoins that have been produced over the last decade or so have been lost. People forgetting the passwords, dying and not telling family that they ever owned it, uh, throwing away the hard drive, you name it. In other words, we shouldn't be dividing Bitcoin's market cap by 19.4 million, we should be dividing it by 
15.4 million because as a practical matter, that's the number of Bitcoins that are available. And if we do that, the price of Bitcoin isn't 2.9 million in 2030, it's 3.6 million. Well, this is how I get to Kathy Wood's prediction of a $1.5 million Bitcoin. I haven't quite been able to come up with the arithmetic for Michael Saylor's $5 million, but I'm willing to bet Michael can share reasons why he believes that is going to happen. So there you have it. My explanation of why I believe Bitcoin is going to reach $420,000 and why, using some creative assumptions, we can go a whole lot higher than $420,000. I want you to tell me here today why I'm wrong. Type in your notion in the Q&A box and we'll tackle your observations as to why my numbers are incorrect. I can think of several reasons why I'm wrong, by the way, just to maybe preempt some of your, your objections. First of all, not everybody equally owns the world's assets. I began by saying if half of everybody puts 1% puts of money into Bitcoin, but not everybody owns the world's assets on an equal basis. So that, that's the first obvious uh, flaw with my assumption. And let's face it, although I said everybody will allocate, come on, that's not going to happen. Not everybody is going to allocate, um, or I should say, probably not. And they're not going to allocate evenly. Some folks are going to allocate a whole lot more than 1%. Many already do. Others are going to al allocate a whole lot less. And this whole conversation has been only about Bitcoin. I didn't say a word about Ethereum or Solana or Polygon or Algorand or any of the other tens of thousands of coins and tokens that exist. If people are going, in fact, to allocate to crypto, are they going to allocate only to Bitcoin? For sure, it's the oldest. For sure, it's the biggest. For sure, it's the best known. But does that mean it's the only one that anyone will ever allocate to? If people are going to allocate to Ethereum, are they going to do that in addition to Bitcoin? Or will they cut their Bitcoin allocation in half so that they can add an allocation to Ethereum? My simple arithmetic is a Bitcoin-only world, and I'm not so sure that's a realistic assumption. In my case, for example, I own more Ethereum than I do Bitcoin. But that's just me. And I've completely ignored rebalancing, and of course, profit taking. So it, it's pretty obvious that both of those are going to have a big impact on the amount of money being held in Bitcoin and therefore Bitcoin's market cap and so on. And I have a feeling, knowing how smart you are watching this, you're gonna be able to give me a whole bunch of other reasons why my assumptions are flawed. But here's what it comes down to. I personally believe, and I've been involved in the Bitcoin space and the crypto overall since 2012, back when there was only Bitcoin. Uh, and so I've been doing this for goodness now, 12 years. And I truly believe that investing in Bitcoin today is safer than it ever has been. It's not as safe as it will be in the future, but I believe that Bitcoin is de-risking. Today, we're not hearing questions uh, or fears or assumptions that Bitcoin might one day be worthless, that the government might ban it, uh, that the technology may prove to be flawed. It's really quite the opposite. Everybody has pretty well acknowledged that this asset is here to stay, that there is a legitimate set of commercial applications that justify the use and the need for the existence of Bitcoin and other digital assets. And governments around the world, for the most part, are seeking to regulate and embrace Bitcoin rather than seeking to prohibit or ban it. Within that context, look at the difference between a portfolio without Bitcoin versus a portfolio with Bitcoin. If you have a typical 60-40 portfolio, I'm going to assume a 7% annual return. Is that fair? I mean, maybe six, maybe eight, but I think we can all agree uh, mid to high single digits for a 60-40 portfolio over a long period of time. If you were to invest $100 into a 60-40 portfolio and hold it for five years at 7% a year, your 100 bucks would grow to 140. We're ignoring taxes. 
just to keep things simple. We're also ignoring fees just to keep things simple. If on the other hand, you put 1% of the portfolio into Bitcoin, I'm going to give you two extreme outcomes. On the one hand, your 1% allocation becomes worthless. Bitcoin falls to zero. It does in fact disappear. On the other hand, we're going to argue that Michael Saylor is right. Bitcoin rises to $5 million. That means five years from now, your 59, 40, and 1 portfolio, a 1% allocation, would give you somewhere between $139 and $226. With a 2% allocation, you'll have somewhere between 138 and 311. With a 3% allocation, you'll have somewhere between 136 and almost $400. Five years ago, as I would run around the country going to conferences, teaching financial advisors about digital assets, blockchain technology, Bitcoin, and the like, a very common question that I used to get was, why are you investing in Bitcoin? It was a reasonable question. Today, though, as we fast forward to where we are now in the development and adoption of this asset class, the question has shifted. It has shifted from why are you buying Bitcoin to why aren't you buying Bitcoin? In this illustration, if you have a 1% allocation, the worst thing that can happen to you is that you lose the 1%. I don't know that this is going to destroy the financial security in the future for a given investor. But on the other hand, if Bitcoin somehow manages to do what many people are hoping, expecting it to do, we could see double, triple, quadruple the total portfolio value nearly with a small single digit allocation. To put these numbers in a visual sense, here's your choice. You can buy a portfolio that represents the yellow dot, a 60-40 portfolio, and with a 7% return over five years, that's what you're gonna end up with. Or you can invest 1% or 2% or 3% with this potential range of outcomes. To me, it seems pretty easy to understand why an allocation to Bitcoin makes sense, even though none of us can say with any level of certainty that it's gonna work out the way we hope, the way we want. And today there are so many ways that you can invest in digital assets, public mining stocks, proxy stocks, MicroStrategy is the most famous with about $12 billion worth of Bitcoin today. Bitcoin futures ETFs, crypto ETFs, which are picks and shovels approach where they're buying the publicly traded stocks of companies in and supporting the digital assets marketplace, SMAs and TAMPs, private placements for accredited investors, IRA custodians, where you can now buy Bitcoin and other digital assets in a self-directed IRA, 401k plans, where you can use the self-directed uh, option for buying Bitcoin inside your 401k, and of course, the new spot Bitcoin ETFs. I would like to mention that that big list I just went through, you don't have to write it down. I went through it too fast for you to do that. You can get everything I just showed you and a whole lot more at the DACFP Yellow Pages. This is a free source, complete comprehensive of every element of the digital assets marketplace research companies, news services, tax preparation uh, services and providers, um, and all of the investment opportunities as well. It's all available to you for free at DACFP's Yellow Pages. You can access it really easily by clicking on that QR code. I do want to highlight two of the ETFs in particular that are brand new that were launched in January. The Franklin Templeton Bitcoin ETF. I love the symbol, EZBC. Franklin Templeton, of course, is a $1.3 trillion asset manager. They have uh, established EZBC with a fee of just 0.19%, 19 basis points, which is waived until August. Franklin Templeton, one of the largest asset managers in the world, 75 years old, and yet 
they're a pioneer in the digital asset space. Jenny Johnson, the CEO of Franklin Templeton, was named by Coindesk as one of the top 10 most influential people in crypto. Sandy Call, the head of digital assets for Franklin Templeton, is the co-chair of the CFTC Global Markets Advisory Subcommittee for Digital Assets. They've got at Franklin Templeton a 40-person digital assets team. They've been active in crypto since 2018. They've got a full-service blockchain-based technology stack that supports their operations. As I mentioned earlier uh, regarding Benji, the first on-chain uh, blockchain-based money market fund. They're the first U.S. mutual fund company to do this. They also offer two crypto SMA portfolios via Eagle Brook Advisors. And so you can see why I'm a fan of EZBC. And I uh, also want to highlight that you get access to Franklin Templeton's proprietary research covering 30 different coins with a lot of educational content and events to help you stay current at the top of your game. So I encourage you to reach out to Franklin Templeton. We'll add the link in the chat so you can reach Franklin Templeton directly. And Bitwise Asset Management. They offer the Bitwise Bitcoin ETF Trust. The symbol is BITB, more affectionately known as BitB. This fee is not 19 bips, it's merely 20 bips. And I love this, Bitwise donates 10% of their fee to the crypto development community to foster the further development of this ecosystem. BitB is the lowest cost Bitcoin ETF that has assets above a billion dollars. They were the first Bitcoin ETF to publish its Bitcoin wallet address for total 100% transparency. And they offer an incredible amount of advisor support. They held 20,000 advisor meetings last year with a complete dedicated team of regional directors, a couple of dozen of them all over the country, whose sole work is to support you and your efforts. Matt Hogan, the CIO who I referenced earlier, publishes a weekly memo that is available to you for free, easy to subscribe at Bitwise's website. We'll put that in the chat room as well for you. They have done white papers on how you can build a crypto sleeve into your diversified portfolios. They've just released a new white paper on the Bitcoin halving. That's very topical. And they offer a crypto market review that has more than 50 charts in it and a description of the use cases. Millions of people are now using crypto today in a in dozens of different ways. So there are five questions that you need to answer as a financial advisor or investor right now. First, which of the ETFs should you recommend? Second, which clients should invest? Which allocation is best for them? How are you going to communicate your recommendation? And how are you going to respond to the questions and objections the client posed to you? This is the challenge and the goal of advisors today. And we've got a lot of tools to help you. We offer the Spot Bitcoin uh, Advisor Toolkit, which has an easy to use comparison chart of all the different Spot Bitcoin ETFs, videos, a white paper, a cool one sheet infographic. You have an image of it there. It's easily obtained through the QR code. My recommendation and that of us here at DACFP is the following, that you select two or three of these Spot Bitcoin ETFs that have distinctions from each other, such as unique features or a unique value proposition. Allocate low single digits, one to 3% of assets into these ETFs. And if you have model portfolios, don't add these ETFs to them. Instead, create clones. So if you have a 60-40 portfolio, leave it alone. Don't add Bitcoin to it. Create a clone of the 60-40 and let the clone be 58, 40, and 2. By doing it this way, you do not have the obligation of forcing Bitcoin on any client in the firm. Or if you're in a firm with many advisors, you're not even forcing this on any of the advisors in the firm. Let's face it, a lot of folks are still uneducated about Bitcoin and digital assets. Many are still opposed. A great many are still skeptical. So I'm not suggesting that you should mandate that anybody own Bitcoin. I don't think we should mandate that anybody own anything, quite frankly, and certainly not Bitcoin, as speculative an asset as this is. 
So by creating clones of your existing portfolios, you're now making ownership of Bitcoin optional. This makes it non-threatening. You're able to say to your firm's advisors, if you want to use it, here's a portfolio that's the same as your current portfolio, but with a Bitcoin ad addition to it. And you can use it for those clients you choose to provide it to. You're not forcing it on any advisor in the practice. You're not forcing it on any client of the firm. It's a simple, easy, low threat way to make it available to those who are so inclined to want to use it. And once you do allocate to Bitcoin within the portfolio, you might want to consider adjusting the triggers that would cause the portfolio to rebalance. This is because of Bitcoin's outsized volatility. We know it's rather common for Bitcoin to move 1% or 2% a day, 5% in a day, 10% in a day. So that would ordinarily potentially cause the portfolio to trigger rebalancing perhaps more often than you or your clients wish. And by altering the triggers that would generate a rebalance, you can control the frequency of rebalances. And then finally, after that, just manage the portfolio normally, rebalancing, dollar cost averaging, and tax loss harvesting. It's really that simple. If this conversation has piqued your interest, there's a lot more we can share with you at DACFP Vision. This is the longest running digital assets conference in the country that is exclusively for financial advisors. This is our sixth annual event. It's June two to four in Austin. And it's two and a half days of cutting edge content from the leading investors and thought leaders in the space. I also invite you to get your CF, your uh, CBDA, your uh, certified in blockchain and digital assets designation. This is a professional designation listed in FINRA's database of professional designations. It's an online self-study course. You get up to 18 CE credits. Half the course is about the technology. The other half is all about practice management, the investment thesis, portfolio construction, regulation, taxation, compliance and operations, and how to explain all this to clients. We have five different tracks, one for advisors, one for back office, home office professionals, one for the crypto community, another for investors, and we have a separate track for those who live and work outside the United States because our course has been uh, taken by people in 37 countries. Uh, and the course is now available in nine languages. And this week only, both Vision and the CBDA program is available to you at 50% off. We're celebrating the Bitcoin halving. What better way to do it? So if you click that QR code now, you can attend Vision and register for 50% off, just $49. And you'll also save 50% off when you register and enroll in the CBDA program. Just be sure to use the code HAVING. I also encourage you to read my Amazon number one bestseller, The Truth About Crypto. Tune into my daily podcast where we talk not just about crypto, but all about all the topics that matter most in the field of financial planning and personal finance today. If you ever want to reach me, it's real easy to do so. I want to say thank you so much for joining me. We've got uh, some time for some Q&A, so I'll turn this over uh, to Don uh, and uh, invite him to take it away. Thanks, Rick. We have, as you can imagine, many, many, many questions. Uh, I tried to put these in a, in a certain order to hit on the themes that many of you are asking about. Uh, the first one is... One we hear a lot, um, GBTC. So their fee is greater than EZBC and BitB. Uh, the person asks, should I sell my GBTC and immediately buy one of these other ETFs because of the fee difference? He even gets specific saying he's only held GBTC for less than six months. Well, I'm not going to give financial advice. That's not my role here. Um, I will simply tell you that I owned GBTC, owned it when it first came out, owned it for years, very happily so. Uh, and I sold it uh, when these ETFs became available. And I moved that money into a combination of the new spot Bitcoin ETFs, including uh, EZBC and BitB, uh, Franklin Templeton's um, ETF and Bitwise's ETF. It makes, to me, no sense 
to pay one and a half percent in annual fees when these alternatives are 90, 80 percent cheaper. So you should talk with your financial advisor who can give you advice regarding your own circumstances, especially considering the tax implications associated with the potential move. Um, but yeah, I think it is certainly worthy of consideration as evidenced by the fact that I did that. Great. We, we got a number of questions regarding flows. So presently flows seem to be slowing down. What do you think will be the catalyst to drive fl flows back up to get us on target to the 150 billion in net inflows? It's not that the flows have slowed down. And, and by the way, let me mention this real fast because uh, I don't believe I did. Um, the flows are a key element in the assumptions and my calculations as you've seen. Uh, you might want to play with your own set of assumptions uh, or or you know play with a spreadsheet. If you would like, we will send to you my spreadsheet so you don't have to reinvent it. Uh, you can also see if I've got any flaws in my formulas. Uh, and I, Lord, I hope I don't, but maybe you'll find one. So if you would like to get our spreadsheet that uh, allows you to play with the math, uh, all you got to do is send an email to Augie. He is our Director of Advisor and RAA Partnerships. Uh, and his, um, there, well, thank you, Mary Beth. Uh, she just uh, posted Augie's uh, email address. It's Augie at DACFP.com. Uh, and that is in uh, the chat box. And so if you just drop Augie an email, he will shoot you uh, the spreadsheet so that you can play with the math yourself. Uh, so, so to your question, Don, it, it isn't that the flows have slowed. It's that the flows initially were substantially higher than any of us expected upon the launch of the ETFs. See, we, we have to understand, we have to remember how the investment advisory community works. I mean, first of all, we're busy running our practices. We're busy serving our clients. These ETFs became available January 10th, the very beginning of the brand new year. Well, at the very beginning of the brand new year, advisors are still dealing with year-end activities. We're getting ready for tax season, which is just about to begin. Everybody was on vacation the last two weeks of December. So everybody was really pretty busy. And if you're going to allocate to Bitcoin, I think most advisors who do are allocating low single digits. That's what all the industry data tells us, one or 2%. Well, are you going to spend 50% of your time on something that has a 1% allocation when you've got all these other client uh, practice management issues that you're focusing on? So we all anticipated that it was going to be months before investment advisors began to really pay attention to the existing the, uh, existence of these ETFs. And when we look beyond the investment advisors at RAAs and go to the wirehouses, None of the wirehouses approved these ETFs because they always take months, often a year or more, before they put new products on their platform. Uh, when you look at pension funds and endowments, they go through a very slow, laborious due diligence process that requires board approval. Those boards only meet four times a year. You literally have to wait until April for their next board meeting. So it takes time. We were therefore shocked, astonished at the tens of billions of dollars that flowed into these ETFs within the first few weeks of the existence of these products. Well, that, that was from the truly agile, truly focused, independent advisors who were just waiting at the gates to get in on this as soon as they became available. They did. They've done that. There was a pretty limited pool of them. Now the flows are, are coming back to more normal levels as the rest of the financial services industry continues to get their act together. We are anticipating over the next three, six, nine months that the wirehouses are going to come online, family offices, endowments, pension funds, institutional investors, major corporations, and we're going to see the flows coming. What we thought would take a year has taken mere months. And so I'm not discouraged at all. I'm, I'm incredibly excited. And I think, my goodness, if we were able to do $20 billion in a matter of only eight weeks, stay tuned for what's going to happen in two years. It's going to be astonishing. Right. We've got a couple questions about Bitcoin miners. Um, first is, what happens when all Bitcoins are sold? sold? Will miners have the same incentives and what would be the expected value of Bitcoin? Well, first of all, 
Bitcoins are going to continue to be produced. Remember, they get released in blocks every 10 minutes all the way until the year 2140. That's 120 years from now, 115 years. So don't worry about it. It's not going to happen in your lifetime. So I don't think as a practical consideration, it's something we need to be thinking about. However, it is pretty clear that Bitcoin miners only receive, as of the halving last week, three and one eighth Bitcoins with each mining reward. That's half as many as they got two weeks ago when they used to get six and a quarter, which is half again as many as they got four years before that uh, when they used to get 12, uh, 12 and a half. So the reward is shrinking. Now, the hope, the theory uh, is that Bitcoin's price will continue to rise. You know, if you're only getting half as many as before, you want each one to be worth twice as much. So this is one reason people argue that Bitcoin's price will continue to double, to continue to compensate the miners the way they've been compensated. We'll see if that proves true. But the fact is that Bitcoin mining rewards are dropping in economic value. What does that mean for the miners? If they aren't getting a sufficient mining reward, what's their motivation for, for doing the verification uh, and authentication of the uh, blocks? It's the transaction fees. Bitcoin miners, and this is true in the uh, proof of stake blockchains, such as Ethereum, where they get transaction fees, they're called gas fees. There is compensation for you to do the work you're doing. And we believe that the transaction fees will rise. They already have been rising. They've set a new record already for Bitcoin mining transaction fees. And they will continue to rise to compensate for the fact that they're not getting as much money from the uh, block rewards as they used to get. So short answer is I'm bullish on miners. Uh, I own uh, investments in mining stocks as well uh, as part of my diversified portfolio. Uh, and they are available in the um, uh, crypto SMA uh, uh, or the crypto uh, picks and shovels uh, ETFs that are offered by both Bitwise and Franklin Templeton. Uh, and so I, my attitude is don't lose any sleep over the miners. They'll be just fine. And the Bitcoin blockchain will be just fine. Got it. So here, here's a question I found interesting. As Bitcoin grows up, do you think that drawdowns and volatility will subside? I do. Uh, I, I And I think this not merely because I'm bullish on Bitcoin, but because this is how all um uh, publicly traded stocks work in the evolution of their public lives. If you look at an IPO of any company, if you look at the startup of any new venture, the valuation is always extraordinarily volatile in the early days. As the company matures uh, and grows in value, its volatility uh, is reduced. There's no question about it. Uh, you wanna have some fun? Go Google Bitcoin's price history since inception. That's all you got to type in. Bitcoin price since inception. Put that into any search engine. And you'll get the chart you've known and seen a million times. You know, it's the incredible volatility of Bitcoin's price over the last 14 years. Then go Google the price history for the first 14 years of Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, you'll see the exact same chart. Companies, when they're young, new, with a brand new product, untested in the marketplace, uncertain competitive uh, threat, the volatility is astonishing. And as they mature, as they age, as there's consumer adoption, they de-risk themselves. And I believe that Bitcoin will experience the very same. The good news is it becomes safer and safer to invest in Bitcoin. I believe Bitcoin is a much safer investment today than it was five years ago, but it's not as profitable either, right? I mean, you could have bought Amazon stock in 1999. Not too many people had the guts to do that. You were amply richly rewarded if you did and held it. But today, even if you didn't buy Amazon in 99, you own Amazon today, it, I guarantee it's in your stock ETFs, but Amazon isn't going to have the growth potential in the future that it had in its early history. And Bitcoin is true too. I mean, Bitcoin has earned 40 million percent since inception. That party's over. <laughs> it's not going to do that again. 
but it still has tremendous upside potential. I'm arguing it has a 7x upside over the next five years. So I believe that there is still plenty of uh, potential at a far lower level of risk than ever before. So here's a question we get a lot. Um, what is better, holding Bitcoin in an ETF or a wallet or some of each? Yeah, this is entirely your decision. You can buy Bitcoin directly from you know a crypto exchange like Gemini or Coinbase or Kraken or the like. The advantage of buying Bitcoin directly is that you can trade it 24-7. Uh, you can download it to uh, your own cold wallet storage for maximum safety. Um, so that's one way to do it. On the other hand, that's cumbersome. It's complicated. You've got to protect that cold wallet, secure those private keys. You're going to pay commissions that are more expensive than if you use one of these ETFs. Um, but the ETFs only trade during market hours. So it's your choice, your call. Um, I don't think it's a good or bad. I think it's good versus good, and it's a matter of personal preference. Your notion of doing a little bit of both, that sounds like diversification to me. Right. So you you put together a fabulous presentation, and, and here's a question I, I had to ask from the audience. What prevents another cryptocurrency from being the winner of all the growth met metrics that you just showed? Absolutely nothing prevents that from happening. And that's one of the fundamental risks of investing in Bitcoin. I, I don't know how old the person is who wrote that question, but I'll, I'll ask this to that person and to the audience overall. Have, do you remember, Don, I'll ask you since I can interact with you. Do you remember Lotus 123? Yes. What the hell ever happened to Lotus 123? <laughs> it got replaced by Microsoft Excel. Lotus 123 back in the day was the, the thing. That was the state of the art spreadsheet program we all used in business. It's gone. Technological obsolescence is a risk in technology investing. And Bitcoin is the oldest, largest, best known brand, biggest head start. That doesn't mean it's going to survive. And this is why there's an argument among many that you shouldn't own only Bitcoin because you're putting all your eggs in one basket in the crypto space. This is why Bitwise, for example, offers uh, BITW, which is a diversified portfolio of 10 of the largest coins. This is why Franklin Templeton offers uh, the SMA sleeves at Eagle Brook Advisors. Bitwise does as well, where they offer dozens of coins in a single SMA portfolio, precisely to give you the diversification in case somebody comes along and knocks Bitcoin off its perch. So yeah, you're right. That's a risk. You need to be cognizant of it. Do you think Bitcoin's adoption story is critical to other blockchains, such as Ethereum or Solana, or, or can these other blockchains succeed on their own? Well, they will succeed on their own. Uh, each of these, the reason these different blockchains exist is because they solve problems Bitcoin could not solve. For example, um, Bitcoin is great at security uh, and it's great at transparency, but Bitcoin is not great at speed. Uh, it's it's a problem in that regard. And that makes it problematic for use in commercial purposes. This is uh, why Solana was created. Solana allows you to execute transactions at scale much faster than you can with Bitcoin or even Ethereum. Uh, so each of these different coins, and you could say the same thing about Filecoin and um Polygon and Algorand, and the list goes on and on. Each of these different coins has theoretically a value proposition that makes them unique and they would argue better than the others. Uh, which ones are going to prove to uh, have sufficient consumer and commercial interest that have enough people buying the coin, using the blockchain to make it a viable long-term enterprise? Jury's out. Uh, this is still an emerging early marketplace, uh, but there will be, uh, I think, in the end, probably 10 to 20 coins that exist. I mean, I consider them kind of like shoes in your closet. How many pair of shoes do you have? I mean, some people are Imelda Marcos with 500 pair, but most of us have a dozen, right? We've got shoes to go to the opera in. We got shoes to go to the gym in. We got running shoes and casual shoes and shoes for the beach and you know, half a dozen or a dozen pairs for most of us will probably cover it. And I think by the same notion, a dozen or so blockchains will probably cover commercial and consumer need. We're just not exactly sure what those are going to be and whether the future winners have even been invented yet. 
As we come up on the hour, I intentionally save this as the last question. Um, and the answer, I mean, it's obvious. Well, maybe not so obvious. When is your Ethereum price prediction webcast, <laughs> especially if you favor it over BTC? <laughs> that's great a really good question. That, that's a great question. I don't know. I'm struggling enough with this one. I am anxiously waiting everybody's reactions to this webinar. Uh, and to the uh, math and the simple arithmetic that I've offered here. So uh, we'll see. We'll see how this one goes, and then uh, we'll we'll tackle Ethereum next. Um, but this has been an awful lot of fun. I hope it's been helpful and educational for you. I hope it has given you something new to think about. Uh, I know we weren't able to answer everybody's questions here. I encourage you to send me your question directly, uh, if you would like. Uh, the link is... Um, available readily at our website at dacfp.com. Uh, I'm easy to find uh, online as well uh, at all the uh, social media sites. We're here to help you and here to help you help your clients. Uh, so let us know what we can do to help you because that's all that we're trying to do. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, oh, there's the connection. Thank you, Mary Beth. dacfp.com forward slash connect. Um, if we can be helpful, let us know. Have a great afternoon. Look forward to seeing you again soon. Don, thanks for your help.